Thank you very much, Grazia. And uh, thank you, IPAM, Chris, and the, um, Christian and the team for um, this wonderful uh, workshop. Um, thank you to everybody who's still here uh, because this is late in the day, uh, especially in Europe. Those who are still awake, I hope you managed to get some dinner uh, along the way, Grazia. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I pre appreciate you, um, you again, uh, stay, staying up so, so late for, for this. Okay, so we're gonna have a friendly conversation uh, about um, deployment of autonomous fleet mobility services. This is very much related to the topic that uh, uh, Patrick was, uh, was presenting, so it should be um, fairly easy to slide into it. Now I had, so note the one term here uh, at scale in my title, uh, that's because we're interested in algorithms and procedures that work at scale in large networks ultimately, uh, just like uh, uh, Pascal, Pascal, um, Pascal was. So uh, very much um, um, you know, along the same lines of trying to have algorithms, procedures that run in real networks, um, not idealized networks, not uh, Sioux Falls or any of these small sort of uh, contrived networks, but so then, uh, you know, procedures that can run in networks like Chicago, uh, Atlanta, New York, um, um, London, Milan, and so on. Now I said I want to. I said to myself today, okay, I'm not giving a COVID talk. I'm not going to talk about COVID. But what a relief not to talk about COVID because it seems to be what we were talking about these days. But uh, I did want to mention one one plug here. Following up on the previous presentation, if you are interested in the impact of COVID on transit, uh, our center held in the summer, particularly in, in July and August, a series of asynchronous virtual roundtables, uh, mostly with transit in, industry folks, as well as uh, related urban services companies. And those are all available. Um, in fact, uh, you can, you know, you, in fact, you could get them through YouTube, but the easy way to access them is through the um, tiny URL that you see here at the bottom. Uh, it's simply uh, TCAVR, TC for Transportation Center, AVR for Asynchronous Virtual Roundtable. And um, those are, again, available to the public. And so you'll hear interviews, for example, with the CEO of the Transit uh, of the Chicago Transit Authority, uh, uh, also um, uh, Washington, D.C., um, Vancouver, Jacksonville, and, and various others in terms of how they were deal with, um, with COVID-19, because it's interesting, the previous talk where, where Atlanta may be shrinking its service, Chicago said, no, we're not, we're going to keep it because it's an essential service and we cannot take pieces of it out. In fact, they increased frequency on certain bus routes to promote social distancing. So it's a different approach to dealing with uh, COVID-19 reduction in demand that, that existed overall. Okay. So our motivation here, and that's really the motivation of a lot of the talks in this, uh, um, in, in this program, um, is that uh, connected autonomous vehicle systems are likely to be major game changers. We say they will be major game changers in traffic, mobility, and logistics. It's really a question of what form, at what rate, to what kind of evolution path. And it's that evolution path that motivates a lot of the work we're doing here because ultimately, um, for these systems to provide the benefits to society, we need to kind of uh, try to integrate them with, in, with existing services rather than having sort of a free-for-all um, um, type of situation. Okay. And I added here that COVID-19 will likely accelerate the process uh, because, uh, um, in fact, we're seeing across the board, more interest in automation, more interest in trying to get humans out of the loop, spreading, et cetera. And that is uh, generating, uh, again, more investment, both on the freight side, as well as on the personal mobility side. Now, there are seven factors that I like to, to list usually that are affecting future mobility from, a, you know, from a if you look at what what is, what is bird, you know what, what bubbling here. Uh, on one hand, of course, personal uh, with mobile computing, communication technologies, ability to personalize trajectories, etc. Connected, automated, shared, electric, social. That is um, influence of social media, but also non-motorized in some instances because where we can bicycle, where we can walk, more people are interested in using these active modes of transportation. 
Um, the key motivating questions for you know, a lot of the work that's going on in our program, but also in the transportation community, in terms of sort of the network level questions in terms of the impact of connected automated vehicles is how do we plan for a world in which vehicles are autonomous and connected? How adequate are existing modeling platforms to address CAV aspects? And the answer is not, 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 not enough. Um, and the main question today though is how will emergence of CAV impact the supply of mobility services and how will these affect existing modes? In other words, what should transit do about it? Transit being conventional transit do about it. Um, how will demand respond to technological features of CAVs as well as to new mobility supply options? And earlier in this program, we heard Elisabetta Kirky talk about some approaches study behavior and demand, and um, always uh, important to, um, to be humble and, and ask, well, how confident are we in our ability to predict these future developments and their impacts? So uh, in a study we conducted for the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, Federal Highway Administration, we, can, we formulated essentially uh, what they call a gap analysis and a list of uh, questions and features that models should incorporate in order to address the uh, impacts of CAVs. And those are at four different, um, four different categories on the demand side, supply side, operational performance, and network integration. And today I'm gonna talk about supply changes, that is shared fleet operations, and also network integration, particularly with transit networks. Okay? So looking at supply changes and the emergence of mobility as a service and shared fleet operations. Okay? Uh, so. Again, we're envisioning future, and we've been discussing that in this in this workshop, um, various mobility service delivery models, okay, where uh, fully autonomous AVs would be expected to accelerate existing trends towards shared urban mobility by eliminating costs and performance limitations that are associated with human drivers, allowing them to compete with personal vehicles in terms of cost and quality of service, such as short wait times, very important in this instance, uh, as was mentioned previously, the fact that you can, you know, request the ride and it's there when when you get to to the, 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 the you know to the street is an important factor and uh, the notion of mobility as a service where everyone may have access to a portfolio of services for different purposes uh, with multiple public transit modes shared by shared fleet of private vehicles rides on demand and so on and so in that world, we expect to see a wide variety of AV fleet business models. And you have to remember that, you know, before Uber emerged, people were not really thinking that this would emerge or Lyft or, or, or DD or what, what have you. And so a lot of things may happen that we do not necessarily no, because some entrepreneur is going to have that vision and they're going to invest and, and, and take a risk and so on. So we have to recognize that some of these things may and will happen, in fact. Uh, and an exercise to try and, and, and identify various possibilities. Mike Highland, uh, who at the time was a student, now he's at UC Irvine and he will be speaking, I believe, on Friday, uh, formulated a taxonomy of possible services where you can identify different potential potential variants here. And uh, the, the dimensions of this taxonomy are the different decisions that a mobility providers might be making regarding pricing, regarding uh, reservation time frame, whether you have reservations at all with advanced requests or the requests are immediate, whether the rides are shared or not shared, shared with whom and with which parameters, uh, whether uh, if it's a reservation, whether it's for a ride point to point, or or for using a service, uh, sort of like zip cars, like car rental by the hour kind of thing. And those have different implications on how you will manage your fleet and operate it. Whether the vehicles are heterogeneous or homogeneous. Homogeneous is simpler to assign because they're substitutable, but in a broader mobility as a service environment, I want to have access to a, a, a sports car for some occasions, or I would like to have access to a, a big SUV to take all my friends uh, if we don't want to socially distance, um, and, and, and so on. Um, same, um, again, you look at fleet size elasticity. Uh, one of the genius factors of the Uber model has been that the 
fleet sizes, in fact, can, can grow and shrink based on, on the demand, right? They're not investing in assets. It is asset light. But with autonomous vehicles, especially initially, you probably need to have a, a, a fleet. But then uh, let's say that there are privately owned autonomous vehicles as well. Why couldn't my privately owned autonomous vehicle go work for autonomous Uber when I'm not using it? For example, if I want to allow people to use my very special vehicle. So you can have both fixed fleet size as well as a variable fleet size. And then, of course, fuel type here is very important because you have to refuel uh, and you have to think of if it's, you know, recharge, for instance, if it's electric and that becomes a constraint in the routes that we're forming. Um, in addition to these strategic level decisions, there are tactical decisions on vehicle repositioning, whether you can divert on route vehicles, whether you hold a request before assigning it so you can come up with a better assignment and so on. So within this taxonomy, uh, my Mike Highland uh, started addressing some of these, and um, um, in uh, a paper uh, in Trespass Research Part C and another one in Part A, what he examined was the case where we had point-to-point -point, uh, um, trips with immediate requests. So there really was no a prior reservation. You just uh, uh, you know call for a ride. And so for that, again, we call it the autonomous Uber, basically, or autonomous taxis. Um, that's probably one of the simplest uh, models to, to address. And we did version with sharing and a version without sharing. The ver version with sharing uh, is the one that was published in uh, Transport Research Part A uh, this, this year. And uh, we did that with homogeneous vehicles primarily, okay? Um, he did another version uh, with uh, pre uh, previous uh, reservations, but those were, um, um, again, uh, essentially immediate requests. So there really was no reservation. They were immediate requests for a rental vehicle, essentially. And so what I'm, what I want to, talk about today is a, a new variant, in fact, where we have a mixed fleet problem, uh, SAMS being uh, shared autonomous mobility uh, services, uh, mixed fleet problem for both on-demand ride sharing, like calling your Uber, but also car sharing with, re with reservations, like, uh, um, you know, like, a, like a zip car. And essentially, you're using the same fleet to serve these two different types of, uh, um, uh, of services. And so here, we have both then point-to-point -point type service and reserved for a certain number of hours where you have control over that vehicle. It's not being centrally routed and so on. You are now the user of that vehicle for your own purposes. And it's a combination of advanced requests as well as immediate requests. The advanced requests being primarily for the hourly type rental, the zip cars, and the immediate requests being for, uh, I mean, it could be for the hourly service as well, but typically would be for the point to point services. And in this case, we're doing Doing the no sharing version, though we will um, later uh, extend that to do to do sharing, and this is work that Josep Abkarian, who is uh, present here today, he's participating in this long program, has been working on, and uh, I think he is here today. Uh, so um, the basic idea again was to have the autonomous vehicles serve either the on-demand private right sourcing trips with immediate requests, uh, and also serve car sharing reservations that would be similar to a zip car except that there's an important difference that with the zip car model you have to go to your vehicle to pick it up and so you have these uh, pools of, of, of vehicles that you go and you pick it up same with the uh, with 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 the uh, bicycle sharing system for instance but with autonomous vehicles the car can, can come to you you don't have to go there anymore it will come to you when you at the time that you have requested, uh, and will pick you up from a the, the location that, that that you specify. And so um, that's uh, from a convenience perspective. That's certainly an important factor. And then the problem is to find the best control strategies. Uh, that that is strategies for operating that fleet so as to minimize empty fleet miles and user wait times. And uh, uh, again, where the fleet is operating essentially in these two particular modes, the same vehicles are serving. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, are serving these two distinct type, uh, types of demands. 
Okay, so you have a fleet of, of, uh, of AVs uh, and you have users. Um, we are assuming for now that this is a Manhattan metric, uh, though, uh, um, and, you know, we, we can also solve the same problem in a, um, you know, in, in a general in a general network, but just to simplify for now, we're still using a Manhattan metric here. And then, as I said, two types of requests, the on-demand or ODR requests, uh, where you have a request time, pickup location and drop off location and essentially you are ready to be picked up when you request and then you have the car reservation res where you are requesting a time at which you wish to reserve to receive that vehicle uh, so uh, there is a request so the, there's a time at which the reservation comes in tr then there is a requested pickup time trq uh, and there is then a pickup location and a final drop off location where it will drop you off and then be available for somebody else to use Use it and there is a requested usage time here uh, but of course the actual usage time may be different uh, because you don't necessarily you know you may not have completed your trip and so we assume flexibility here uh, so we're, we're treating the actual usage time as being the actual time plus some random term here that varies uh, across across users okay so the model uh, here the key question that we're trying to answer is when to assign the uh, the, the vehicle and to whom to assign it, okay? So we subdivide time into essentially we have decision epochs. Uh, these are preset essentially. So it's a time-based type of operation. Uh, you have an inter-decision time that's set by the analyst so that the algorithm solution time can, you know, so you can solve the problem essentially within one of these uh, these time steps. Um, so we have such decision epochs that over the, over the sort of planning horizon we're considering. Uh, and then there's, you know, the time at the decision epoch k, it will denote by tk. And so you could see here, um, you know, we're at the beginning of uh, this, 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 uh, this lookup horizon. Uh, and um, we are, uh, so we're at, at time t2 essentially here. Uh, we, you could see where the ODRs uh, are, where the uh, on-demand requests. And then you could see when the, reser the, uh, um, the reservation request is coming in within that purple, the time which is requested. So a uh, so you can see how those are chained. That is right before uh, here T two. You will see a purple solid arrow. That's when somebody has called in that reservation, but they want to be picked up at the time that you see dashed here, and to use then the vehicle for a certain period. And so over our lookup horizon, we are performing an assignment. All of these vehicles, that is the immediate demand request that we know of, and the reservations is um, you know looking. Uh, ahead, so so what what we know are the on demand requests that are have not yet been assigned as well as the status of the assignments made. And we also know, looking ahead in the next 30 minutes, for example, how many reservations do I have? So when I'm assigning now, I'm taking the reservations into account, but I'm not doing long-term reservations. In other words, I'm not looking the day before and assigning these vehicles. I'm only looking 30 minutes into the future and then trying to assign these people. So it's like when you have a restaurant and somebody joins the queue, when they call for a reservation, all you do is you put them in the queue at a certain time, and then when you know, the, then they get they 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 will get assigned. Um, different uh, variables here. We have status for the user, uh, whether they so they could have requested ODR service, they have requested reservation, but have not been assigned yet. Uh, they can be, be assigned for one or the other, but not picked up yet. They can be picked up by one or the other. Uh, they can complete the service um, uh, and uh, with, with ODR or they've been served with a reservation. This is gonna affect what vehicles are available uh, for, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the assignment problem that is being solved. There is an elapsed wait time that is associated with each one of those uh, uh, for, for, for each type of reservation. And we of course have static information on the users, O and D primarily. Uh, and and the current location of the user uh, in the plane that we're considering. For the vehicle, the vehicle can be idle. It can be currently en route to pick up a um, uh, immediate demand user. It can be currently en route to pick up a reservation user. Uh, it can be, it could have reached the customer early and currently waiting, uh, which also could happen for the reservation users, because if you want to make that reservation, you may have to get there earlier. We try to minimize these early periods, but sometimes the penalty 
uh, you know, there is a higher penalty for being late than for being early. Um, that, or it can be en route currently to drop off uh, an ODR user, uh, or it can be in use by a reservation. The reason for the reservations where we don't have the sort of completed e e yet, we, we do not know exactly when it will be complete, completed because it's a random variable, okay? So we may have an expectation but not an, ex an exact time. Um, and of course, we have the location of the vehicles. Okay? So um, the problem here for the AV user assignment strategy is how do we assign vehicles to request, which vehicles to consider, which customers to consider. And three strategies are considered. A simple one that we use as a benchmark, which is first come, first serve, which is you assign users to the nearest idle AV. It's a sequential control strategy with users sorted based on the request or reservation time. Uh, then the reservation requests are considered only when the requested pickup time is soon, soon enough and that may be 30 minutes, that, that varies. And sorting will allow higher priority for reserved uh, rides. Okay, that's one strategy. We use that as a simple heuristic benchmark. Okay? Um, second strategy is an, uh, one where we actually solve an optimization problem. We're assigning the idle vehicles to the unassigned users. And here we consider reservation customers, again, only with their requested pickup time is within the lookup horizon. And with optimization strategy two, what we're assigning are the idle and the en route drop-off vehicles. That's for ODR only to the unassigned users, not the reservation users, again, because that timeline is, is, is uncertain. Um, same, similarly, we consider the reservation customers only when their requested pickup time is within the lookup horizon. And we add a penalty for assigning a uh, um, uh, a, a drop-off um, um, vehicle. So the decision variables here is very simple. Uh, um, it's uh, um, xij is equal to one as vehicle j is assigned to pick up user i at time tk. This is the decision epoch where we're making that decision. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's zero. So there is no scheduling per se that is taking place here. Um, now the objective function, um, two cases. One, uh, the more co common one where the number of vehicles is less than the number of requests. The other case is when you have more vehicles then you have requests there. Problem is simpler, but here is where the choices may be harder to make. And so the terms included, there's the empty distance, uh, there is the elapsed wait time, uh, there is then an early arrival time and a late arrival time penalty, uh, primarily for the reservation requests, and there's a penalty for an unassigned reservation customer that may be at the periphery because other, you know, because if there's an extra distance there because they may need to wait longer. If we do not essentially put a penalty for not serving these, what we find is that they can defer to the next period and to the next period to the next period because they're not, they're not, you know, they're not the most desirable customers to serve, but it's a reservation you have to honor it. And so we, we, we introduce this term in the objective function. Usual constraints uh, in terms of mass balance, making sure that all the vehicles are assigned and so on, the definitional variables regarding early arrival, late arrival, and so on. Now for the case where we have more vehicles, then the objective function is simple. Uh, then we just assign to all of the customers in a way that minimizes total distance. We, we minimize empty, 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 uh, uh, empty miles in that assignment. So there's not much of an issue there. So we did an application of this in, in Chicago Chicago, we took the Chicago taxi data set, uh, similar work that Mike Highland had done, uh, and we assigned, so one of the key parameters is how much of the, the total demand that we're serving is for reservations versus for on demand very critical parameter, okay? Because uh, the reservation obviously will, 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 will be using that vehicle much longer than an on-demand. And on-demand, you pick somebody, you drop them off, then it's available again, uh, if you think of it as a service time from a queuing perspective. But for somebody, for the reservations, once you have that vehicle, you're looking at hours, okay? So it's a much longer utilization of the vehicle from the reservations than from the on-demand uh, on demand request. That is, the zip cars use that a lot more. And so, um, uh, so we generate the, the you know, the, um, the time, 
so this is in how we created the data, basically. I mean, that we that we use. Uh, it's based on actual uh, sort of locations, uh, based on taxi data. But then we had to uh, generate for them a pickup time. And then we assigned a usage time also, which is um, a essentially it's the maximum of the travel time uh, between pickup and final drop off, which is a randomly drawn number here with a mean of of two hours. Okay, um, this is what the requested pickup times are. Uh, for the case that we're solving for car reservations and for on demand. First, we do not know this a priori, okay? This is unfolding. This is a stochastic dynamic system where the, where the demands are unfolding as we go on. And the procedure is very much a rolling horizon type of procedure where we solve the, the, the problem at, uh, you know, at these decision epochs that I've mentioned. So it's not like we're optimizing over all of this a priori, we're not. We are, this is unfolding. This wanted to show you the kind of pattern and the peakedness that exists in it. And you can see it again, the car reservations is about 25% of the, of the, uh, um, of the total. Uh, various parameters about the simulation rates and so on. I'm not going to skip those. So let me show you some results here. This is looking at the empty fleet miles. And as we've known from all the work we've done before, the optimization-based strategies clearly outperform the first come, first serve. Okay? This is as a function of fleet size. Now, as your fleet size increases a lot, then the first come first serve is, is fine. But when you have a, you know, a limited fleet, ultimately, uh, your optimization strategy is gonna give you a much better operation and utilization of your fleet than uh, a, a heuristic like first come first serve. And as you could see here, when you are optimizing with more vehicles, that is the idle ones, plus those that are about to be dropped off, you can do better than simply with the idle. And that's the red one uh, versus the orange one above it. Okay? And this is the, and, uh, again, the, the empty fleet miles that we have. Then, then you can look at the waiting time. Now you have waiting time for uh, those, the, the reservation people. Um, and uh, clearly for the, for the reservation folks, um, we want them to have very small wait time because what's the point of a reservation if you have to wait 40 minutes, right? That's, that's not a reservation. So we want values that are very low. And in fact, again, this is as a function of different fleet sizes. You could see that the optimization strategies are going to reduce uh, this, uh, um, you know, the, the, the percent uh, that, that, that weight considerably. Um, and then to, to obtain similar performance with first come, first serve, you can need a lot more, more, more vehicles. And uh, if you look at the mean wait times for the on-demand versus the reservation, Okay. And we are prioritizing here the reservations. Again, as I've mentioned previously, because it's a reservation, but we do not want the waiting time for the on demand to be more than say five minutes, and you could see here um, again that with uh, you know uh, that uh, as you increase your fleet size here, uh, you you are reducing these wait times to what are acceptable levels. So for the kind of operation we're contemplating here, we're going to need somewhere between 1,300 and 1,400 vehicles with the optimization strategy because first come first serve will will never you know will will not get us that. And correspondingly, if you look at the lower one, you will see that for reservations, uh, even first come, first serve is doing okay. And essentially, we have almost no waiting time left for, um, you know, for, for, the, for the reservation ones. Now, we can tweak the two uh, and, and, you know, and the trade-off, but we felt that it's much more important to honor the reservations in this case. Now, one other problem we've been looking at, and I don't have slides on that, is the following. Let's say you have a certain number of vehicles. Now, what we do is we operate it essentially essentially like a single, you know, a pooled queue. Okay, the vehicle can go to one type of customer or to another kind of customer. Uh, and uh, but on the on the other hand, you, what you could do is do it like separate uh, queues where you have vehicles assigned only for reservations, vehicles assigned only for on demand. And you can show that you will do better when you pool. Uh, though we did find a sweet spot ultimately where the, you can have an optimal uh, sort of separation, uh, an, an independent operation that gives you comparable performance to the uh, to the to the to the pooled operation, but. 
that fraction is dependent on the demands and a lot of factors. So it's not a constant one. It is one that it will be changing dynamically, which is why uh, the, the, the pooled operation will give you much more robust performance. And Josef has been performing a queuing analysis where we can analytically derive these insights. Okay? So I still have 10 minutes here. So in this remaining time, I would like to talk about integrating these mobility services with uh, uh, conventional transit services, transit networks. And so uh, the issue here, uh, again, as, as we've already seen previously, is that really fixed route transit networks struggle to serve heterogeneous travelers effectively across space and time. So if you take residents of low density areas in Atlanta, um, you know, fixed route transit, fixed route, fixed schedule is not a very attractive mode. Uh, if you have employees that work outside the CBD, transit is not a very attractive mode. And this is where shared mobility services are very attractive. And particularly with autonomous vehicles, you can reduce the cost. And uh, what the idea is then, why not use transit for what transit is best at, that is moving large numbers of people along predetermined corridors, and then kind of use your autonomous shared mobility service to feed those. Again, a similar problem to the one that we heard previously. And so the, prob the, the technical problem here is how do you allocate resources between transit routes and subsidy of shared use AV mobility services, subsidy because we want to make it comparable essentially in cost to transit service. So instead of putting more buses and drivers, we are now using these autonomous vehicles uh, in, uh, um, instead. And again, this is recognizing the obvious complementarity, uh, again, between conventional transit and shared autonomous vehicles. Uh, uh, so we, the idea is to improve the quality of transit service by reallocating resources between transit and SAVs in an integrated system. So you could put more of your resources on the lines where you have high frequency of service, you give very good service that is competitive than with personal mobility uh, services and uh, reduce the wait times, uh, uh, more seating capacity, et cetera. Whereas then you have the flexibility of the shared autonomous vehicles. So we've developed here an optimization model and a solution approach to jointly design transit network and the shared use AV mobility service so as to maximize service quality, that's our objective, subject to a capital budget, to an operating budget, and then to achieving an equilibrium, essentially a time-dependent equilibrium um, at the, you know, for the system in terms of both mode and, and route. Uh, and... Um, Again, recognizing that the transit pattern demand and the SAMS fleet demand are not known a priori. So we're endogenizing the mode choice here. We're endogenizing the demand because the demand is going to split depending on the service that you're providing. And the simplest way to illustrate it is in this conceptual framework here, okay? So you have essentially on the transit side, the design problem, uh, you have the root frequencies. now. In the previous presentation, uh, they, you know, one was designing the entire network. We're looking at it here more as a redesign. So you have the base network laid out, and then you are assigning frequencies to it, where frequency could be zero, that is no service. So it would be like eliminating those particular routes or, uh, or, or, or patterns. And on the SAM side, we determine the fleet side, how many vehicles are providing that particular service. Uh, there is a demand in terms of origin, destination, and time for that SAMS demand. And there is then the root level transit demand that is, uh, you know, that determines the resulting frequency. So what we're deciding here at the design stage is what is the fleet size and what should be the frequencies on each of the lines. Now, if I'm imagining adding lines, I could include those and then let the optimization give me a positive frequency for it. And that determines whether that route is provided. And so uh, to determine the performance of this design, this is where we need to go to the lower level, which is where the evaluation is performed, evaluation consisting of mode choice and assignment. Um, the mode choice takes as 
inputs the transit level of service and the SAMS level of service, which are in turn determined on the transit side by a multimodal transit network assignment tool, in this case called NUTRANS. Uh, and uh, on the SAMS side, it's a simulation optimization similar to the one that I had presented, the only looking at ODR, the, on, the immediate on-demand requests in this application, not the reservations. In a broader system, we can also do the reservations in competition with private autos and so on. Now we're focusing on the, on the ODR service. And so that's the lower level where we perform the evaluation. So given the design, what will be the cost, impacts, level of service, et cetera. And so the, the mode choice gives us the transit and SAMS transit demand, that is SAMS as a feeder to transit, and it will give us SAMS demand. And that will all need to be iterated to be equilibrated at the lower level uh, be, so that we can determine then the demand for SAMS and the demand at the, uh, uh, at, the, at the upper level that we obtain from the lower level, okay? So that's the general framework. To, there's a large literature, uh, we're not gonna get into that here. The mathematical formulation, as, a, as again, it's a joint transit network redesign and SAMS fleet determination problem subject to user equilibrium and, uh, and uh, subject to a dynamic combined mode choice traveler assignment problem, the lower level. And then we use the transit network frequency setting problem as a base, except we let frequently effectively go to near zero when we're not providing service. So this is the objective function uh, um, uh, at the upper level. Um, the first term is the average user wait time for transit pattern P. Transit pattern essentially is like a subroute. It's a route with, uh, um, you know, where, where, where you have alternate types of services, which is typically done in large scale uh, transit networks. The second one is the average user time for SAMS. Again, in the time interval considered, uh, we're including here as well, transit rejections, LP, uh, which are assumed to become SAMS demand. And we have a penalty term for transit vehicle boarding rejections on pattern P, and then a penalty for the demand rate uh, exceeding the supply rate in the SAMS um, interval. Because one thing you, you want to be careful here is that there may be a complete hollowing out of transit to going out to SAMS. And so you have to have the right sort of trade-offs and parameters to obtain a solution that is meaningful in this case. Again, the variables um, here, we have the demand for the transit pattern, that's EP. So you multiply the demand for transit uh, for a particular route or pattern by half of a headway in this case, HP is the headway. Uh, then we have have the demand for SAMS, that's E, T, SAMS, uh, at time T, it's a lower level decision variable. And then we have an expected wait time, which would be a function of the upper level decision variable. To be able to, so in, in, to, be able to solve this, we also introduce an analytical approximation of the average SAMS waiting time that is used only at the upper level, because the upper level essentially can be solved uh, with a solver, uh, and we we use, um, okay, let me just mention the constraints here. We have an operating budget constraint. We have a transit vehicle fleet size constraint, a capital budget constraint, headway constraint, transit crowding constraint. We don't want transit to get too crowded and a SAMS crowding constraints as well. And then the statement of the, uh, the equilibrium conditions that need to be met at the lower level, okay? So to solve this, ultimately the upper level problem, we use a non-programming, uh, non-linear programming solver. We use Knitro essentially because all of the terms are analytically defined, and that's why we introduce a waiting time as an analytic function, so we could actually send this to the solver and get a solution from it, which is where we get then the transit frequency patterns and the SAMS uh, uh, fleet size. At the lower level, we are running a transit assignment simulation and the optim the fleet assignment simulator for the uh, uh, for, for for SAMS and. Uh, it, it gets tricky in terms of chaining those and to make sure that there is a convergence pattern. Ultimately, we take the k solution and adjust it after evaluation from the lower level. And we have a, uh, a smoothing solution essentially to where we view uh, the solution that we obtained from k as giving 
us a direction and then uh, in which to, to, to move our decision variables. Uh, and so that's how we go from one iterate to the, to, to the next one uh, in terms of finding our solution. Putting it all together, uh, I'm going to skip the details of the assignment and uh, and the uh, the assignment tool uh, presented several times before. But looking at this case study here, what we said is uh, so we took the Chicago Transit Authority bus and elevated transit rail system that's shown here, as well as commuter rail. We assume that sa the SAVs operate in that red box there, which is Evanston. Uh, so they pick up in there. Uh, in Evanston, and then there's a five mile buffer area around that where you where 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 it is operating in terms of the destinations. Okay, uh, so we didn't allow it to serve the entire area, only demand that is there. Okay, so let me show you here. This is the convergence pattern. Uh, I mean, sorry, sorry to. Uh disturb your presentation. We are running out of time. If we want to have some time for questions, uh, uh, it would be good uh, to wrap I'm up. Concluding. I'm concluding. Okay. Uh, so this is showing us the convergence pattern. Uh, so the thing converges, that heuristic solution approach is converging uh, with all the different sort of assumptions that we considered. Um, and if we look at uh, the value of the objective function, uh, with SAMs versus uh, without SAMs, you could see the improvement in the user cost that we get in the solutions with that with the with the autonomous vehicle services, as opposed to not having them and having those users only use the conventional transit system. Uh, same uh, with the um, um, and this is some robustness investigation. If you look at the average waiting time here, I want to show that again. Uh, you, the, the the improvement that we get in the average transit waiting time per Evanston traveler and the average SAMS waiting time for these Evanston travelers where it is available. So it is again hovering at about five uh, minutes uh, as we are converging. Okay, so um, some key takeaways here. What should transit agencies do? Uh, we tell transit agency that they should embrace change and rethink how to best accomplish their mission. Uh, they should really think of themselves as the mobility as a service provider. Think mobility, not just transit. Uh, may, you know, whether you own the autonomous vehicle fleets, whether you contract contract out with third parties to provide these services, uh, um, or letting private sector maybe work out preferred profitable service business models, all of these are possibilities, but be a partner and coordinate rather than simply uh, um, continue to provide the same services without coordination, try to redirect resources. And so transit agencies we think should dramatically restructure and rationalize transit network, focusing on high frequency, high capacity, high service quality services, such as rail and BRT, and then rely on SAV fleet services for local area travel, access to high capacity lines. And I didn't show those results, but when we look at the, at the frequencies and where they have been allocated, they have clearly gone to the areas that have much higher demands. So the, 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 you know, when we examine the, the actual frequencies assigned to the various routes and where those were, the formulation was accomplishing, I think, what we had expected here. And this will give us a tool then for determining what are the most promising corridors in which to focus these, uh, these, uh, the, 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 these resources. And I will stop with that. So um, thank you.